morning friends and welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. My dear friends, you will all admit that we have come a long way in this course, but has the longing for poetry stopped? I think not. You are enjoying these lectures and the lectures are being delivered by Menod Mishra. Now today we are going to enter a new phase of Indian English poetry. Dear friends, Indian English poetry has witnessed several revolutions, several changes and it has not kept quiet. We have already read pre-independent Indian English poetry, post-independent Indian English poetry and now we are going to talk about a new development in Indian English poetry and that is the writing of haikus. Now naturally when I say haiku, many of you are suddenly taken back to Japan because this haiku form of poetry was developed in uh, Japan and, and, and that is why you find uh, that even in Indian English uh, poetry also, uh, we can find uh, that many Indian English poets of late have taken to writing haikus, though it was Rabindranath Tagore who had also tried his hand at haiku writing. Uh, but today we shall see what haiku is and who are these Indian English poets who are trying their hands at haiku writing. As I told you earlier my dear friends that haiku is one of the oldest forms of poetry which was discovered and later on uh, promoted and proliferated in the 20th century. Paul Louis collection haiku in the early 20th century gave a new way to haiku poetry. Previously it was actually called hokku and it was termed haiku by Masaoka Siki in the 19th century. Haiku has its root in the poetic form tanka which is also a form of prayer to gods by the Japanese. Now poets like Baso and Esha in Japan made it very popular and even, even some English and American poets also started trying their hands at haiku writing namely American poet Ezra Pound, Amy Lowell and T. E. Helm adopted this poetic form in the western world. Now what actually are the differences between the haiku form of poetry and other forms of poetry? It actually has a different a syntactic structure. Any 17 syllable poem which is written in 5-7-5 five, syllable pattern is called haiku. Most of you might have come across a haiku which actually consists of three liners and you know even though they are sought but they are full of meanings and they at times surprise you. Uh, the beauty of a haiku lies in the first and the last line. We will find that how this uh, poetic form of haiku, how haiku has uh, been developed across other languages as well. Haiku uh, does not believe much in the rules of grammar and it also can eliminate all forms of though in poetry we can say that poets have got a sort of license and they can uh, create their uh, poetic uh, form in uh, the form that they want. But haiku itself is completely different. If we take uh, a look at the modern times we can find that poets have experimented a lot in this poetic form and many of uh, the Indian poets writing in English they have also started uh, trying their hands and many of them have actually blossomed forth also very beautiful haiku poems. Now as I told you earlier that it was Tagore in India who started and who is also considered to be the first poet who wrote haiku poems. Uh, it was such that in 1916 when Tagore had visited Japan, 
he also translated some haiku poems of the Japanese poet Basso into Bengali. Tagore has himself said that we do not find three line poem anywhere else in the world. These three lines are enough for their poet and the readers. The heart of the Japanese people, it is, it is quite worthy to note here what Tagore says about haiku. The heart of the Japanese people does not sound like a waterfall, it is quite like a lake and so is the case with haiku. So, haiku has uh, got uh, the scope uh, to convey everything, but it has got a sort of quietness like that of a lake. We can take a short uh, poem here. Oh Japan, thy oceans are restless, thy land is calm, mountains are deep and steep, thy landscape is soft and green. Now, we can also take the example of some of the haikus uh, which were written by Basso, then Issa, fine. Now, let us have a look at how haiku is created. The three lines are there. An old silent pond, a frog jumps into the pond, splash, silence again, fine. Uh, Ezra Pound, the name I mentioned, Ezra Pound in a haiku entitled in a station of the metro says, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. So, the last line appears to be like the falling ones and they actually provide you with a sort of meaning which actually conveys a lot. We can also uh, take for example, though uh, time cannot permit us, uh, if time permits we can also take uh, the example of uh, Tagore's haiku poem, uh, but at present uh, let me tell you who are the famous Indian English poets who have tried their hands at haiku writing. One such is T. Basudev Reddy and the other one that we will also talk about in the lecture to follow. Uh, will be R. K. Singh. These two people, apart from being Indian English poets, even though they have written a lot of poems in other uh, fields, but what they have attracted their attention uh, uh, is by their beautiful haikus. So, what we shall do is, we shall try our level best uh, to talk about some of the poems and then we will perhaps concentrate more on their haikus because uh, we, are, we are in the phase of Indian poetry in English where many Indian poets have tried their hands at haiku writing. Now, who was uh, Basudev Reddy and uh, what actually are the qualities uh, that made Basudev Reddy a uh, poet and then after all a haikuist. Reddy was uh, born on first 21st uh, December 1943 in a small village of Tirupati of Andhra Pradesh, India. So, in a temple town uh, Tirupati as uh, many of you are familiar with, uh, uh, T. Basudev uh, Reddy uh, was born. T. Basudev Reddy was a PhD on uh, Jane Austen. Uh, before doing his PhD, he did his, his MA in English and then followed by this, uh, he did a PhD on Jane Austen. He was actually a um, professor and he had several awards to his name, uh, but actually in Indian scenario the irony is uh, that despite being such a wonderful poet, uh, T. Basudev Reddy has not got the attention that he actually deserves. And that is why my dear friends in this uh, um, course on Indian poetry in English, I have also tried to bring or accommodate those poets who have got a lot of substance in them and they require a wider attention. Actually, it is quite ironical to note that many such Indian English poets have got uh, themselves recognized in other countries, but in Indian scenario, uh, they have not been given that much of space, that much of attention. This is actually uh, a, a sort of, uh, you know, irony of situation and the regions may be galore by different. T. Basudev Reddy was the secretary of uh, the Guild of Indian e English Writers, Editors and Critics. Uh, Reddy had started writing just during his college age 
and uh, the very first uh, poems uh, that came out were in some of the journals and then he started writing in English and uh, he has to his credit 12 poetry collections, 2 novels and 3 critical books. He is actually a prominent poet as I have been telling you who is considered to one of the famous haiku writers in Indian poetry in English. What is actually more significant about this poet is he does not have that much of limelight. Born in Tirupati and he confined himself to Tirupati and that is why uh, if you have a look at uh, the poetic uh, world of uh, TV ready, you will find that majority of the settings of his poems are in the rural landscape in the rural landscape. So, he is such a poet who celebrates rural India and searches for the outside life in the world of spirituality. Of course, uh, it was very uh, cruel of God to have snatched uh, T. Basudev Reddy only last year. In 2020, uh, T. Basudev Reddy uh, uh, left for his heavenly abode. And uh, uh, let me also admit that I was in association with him and then uh, the day I talked to him only after three or four days suddenly somebody gave me the message that Professor T. Basudev Reddy is no more. So, that was very uh, sad on my part. Uh, now, uh, T. Basudev Reddy had several awards to his credit, several achievements. He got the International Eminent Poet Award in 1987. Uh, his uh, poems actually had such an effect on the outside world uh, that he was uh, given honorary delight from the World Academy of Arts and Culture, San, Fran San Francisco, US. And then uh, he also was recognized as one of the best teachers. And then he got uh, Michael Madhusudan Award. Uh, even after retirement, he was living in his own village and composing poems and he had also got a UGC award of national fellowship as a visiting professor in 1998 and in 2009, he had got award of excellence in world poetry. Now, T. Basudev Reddy has got 12 poetry collections uh, to his name and it will be very difficult to touch upon all the uh, poetry collections, uh, but in a way, I will try to touch upon some of his major works. Uh, but my focus here will be uh, my concentration on his haiku poems. His very first collection uh, was When Grief Reigns, When Grief Reigns. Then came the broken rhythms, the fleeting bubbles, melting melodies, gliding ripples, echoes, quest for peace, the rural muse, thousand haiku pearls, which uh, we will uh, give more attention to, then golden veil, sound and silence, the pulse of life, essential readings and then last year only he had published Light Eternal, a spiritual poem and perhaps this Light Eternal was a sort of call to the eternity and he had to leave, he had to uh, have a journey for the eternity. So, these are the names of his collections. Uh, now, we will try our level best uh, to discuss some of the early collections and then we will come uh, to uh, the discussion on his haiku poems. As I have been telling that he was not only a poet, but he was a novelist and he has also written uh, some critical books. Two of his novels, uh, namely The Vultures and Minor Gods were published. The vultures once again like his poetry collections has got the rural settings and uh, he also wrote uh, minor gods. So, in a way if you look at the titles you can find that there is a sort of melancholia in this uh, poet and majority of his works are also rooted in despair. Uh, there are only some uh, way some rays of delight, but then they are very scant. The poet is very much dipped uh, into despair. And the despair is not only personal, the poet actually makes a journey from the personal to the impersonal. The poet actually tries to look at the scenario of India uh, from being an insider and also tries to look at as being an outsider as well. So, since he had done his PhD on Jane Austen, 
Uh, there is also a book entitled Jane Austen, The Dialectics of Self-Actualization in her novels. That might have been perhaps the conversion of his PhD thesis. And then another book that came out, Jane Austen, The Matrix of Matrimony. And then he also had one critical survey of Indo-English poetry. Now, what are actually the themes of Reddy's poetry? Reddy was a, a person who even after retirement, he had actually become a principal and then uh, he, ha he was a, v a UGC visiting professor, uh, fine. Uh, but then he was living in his small temple town of Terupati and uh, most of the time he used to go to his village. Uh, that is why one can find uh, the landscape of uh, you know rural India in his poetry. But then he has his eyes for even uh, the common, common subjects. It is often said uh, that uh, at times one can find uh, the plight of uh, the poor people in his poems, then the miseries, the obstacles. One can also notice uh, some amount of outburst or outburst of anger at times and these outbursts uh, at times many people say that uh, uh, at times TV Reddy was not able to control his own emotions and that actually erupted and uh, many of the poems are very harsh, very harsh. That is why some of the poems are very satiric, very ironic. So, uh, in, in uh, the world of uh, TV Reddy, one can find the picture of rural India and there is a shift from local to global. There are all sorts of aspects depicted in his poetry, city life, village life, no? Uh, then the life of the farmers, the life of the village women, uh, the life of uh, uh, leaders, the life of youngsters, uh, the life of academicians. And, and you know, uh, it is no wonder to find uh, uh, TV ready at times satirizing how the libraries are being neglected. Fine. And he at, at times says, it has become a mortuary of books, mortuary of books. And then, um, at times also when he makes uh, comments after comments, you know, actually TV Reddy was uh, to a great extent very straightforward. He did not carry any ill will against anyone, but then he was a realist. So, he cannot control himself, no, he cannot control himself at times uh, speaking at the degradation of moral values. One can also find uh, there is a progression from one uh, collection to another. There is a progression towards the spiritual quest and it was only uh, this uh, spiritual quest when he uh, wrote the eternal light. Uh, then perhaps there was a call from the Almighty and he had to leave. So, uh, there is also a picture of memory and loss in many of his poems. Sometimes many people also say that uh, there are instances of personal uh, losses and these personal losses uh, were uh, pictured or colored uh, with the loss of his own spouse. So, at times uh, he became very uh, uh, romantic, but then he was sardonic also. He was influenced by many of uh, the uh, poets, uh, but then uh, he has in many of the interviews said, if he had to pick up only one uh, literary character, who could it be? And T. V. Reddy uh, very, you know, simply says it was Hamlet in which one can find all sorts of pictures. So, uh, Reddy's uh, poetry, if we take uh, uh, something from the introduction of the pulse of life, his poetry is a pleasant blend of the traditional and the modern, the realistic and the romantic, the symbolic and the imagist. You can find a plethora of images uh, pervaded throughout. Uh, Reddy's poetry, the urban and the rural, satirical and lyrical streams of poetry. Now, what are the features apart from uh, his poetry being rooted in the rural surroundings? There is a sort of suggestiveness in his poetry. And another quality that uh, T. V. Reddy has uh, his uh, uh, grasp over uh, humor, his grip and grasp over humor. Reddy tries to fuse personal with a universal. He is satiric, no doubt, but then one can also find the picture of varying moods. So, you cannot say that he is simply confined to one theme or one subject. One can find variety of colors in the world of TV Reddy. Uh, we can take uh, uh, one, um, some of the lines from one poem entitled Women of the Village, where you can find how he uses, how he makes comparisons. Uh, and then how very metaphorically when even when he is uh, talking about 
uh, the boiling and the toiling of uh, the village women, he says. In that double roasted hamlet, in that double roasted hamlet, women stand like expiring candles. See the uh, use of uh, the simile here, like expiring candles. So, very suggestively he says how women are, they are just like expiring candles. A thing from which you get all sorts of sources, all sorts of delights, but then they are just like expiring candles. Water moves in concentric circles like their daydreams. A woman carrying water. So, water moves in concentric circles like their daydreams, wearing desires in the plates of their cobra hair, in the plates of their cobra hair. So, very beautiful use of simile and uh, metaphor. So, the comparisons that you come across in the uh, poetic world of Reddy, they actually suggest a lot. So, let us take uh, the very first collection and the uh, title poem entitled, When Grief Reigns. It is said that the very first collection uh, had a deep imprint of melancholia, fine. And uh, if you read the lines, you can find how the poet uses melancholy. When gales of sorrow wreck my surging spirit, misery storms my being and grief reigns incessantly. The poet actually uh, tries to put, uh, you know, even, even, you know, life in inanimate objects. And then he says, I wish to drench myself, depart from these ills and enter the pores of the earth. The poet is so dissatisfied uh, with the sort of, you know, unusual situations around him. With drops of rain that seep still somewhere in me, a dim desire creeps unawares to possess the instinctive Macintosh. The poet is amid sorrow, the poet is amid grief, but he always wants himself to be covered by a Macintosh, by a raincoat, by something that could protect him. So, while he is talking about some of his personal experiences, but then he has always man in his vision. We can also uh, take because it is very difficult to touch upon all the poetry collections, but let me take uh, a gliding ripples and some poems from the gliding ripples, because uh, uh, my intention today is to talk about specifically uh, the haikus of T. V. Reddy. So, this gliding ripples which came out in 2008, so this gliding ripples also talks about the ills of the society. Uh, one can also find uh, some amount of contemplation, serious contemplation. Uh, the poet as a social thinker, we can call T. V. Reddy. He is not only a poet, because as he himself says uh, that a poet is of course a poet, but then we can find a thinker in T. V. Reddy who actually cannot confine his eyes to the grim reality that are surrounded around him. So, the first section of this gliding ripples has got uh, 57 poems and the second has got 100 haikus, haikus uh, being our uh, subject. We can take uh, some of the poems because you know here he talks about both the pictures. There is one poem entitled Oh America. Now, on the one hand he talks about how beautiful is America and how everything is quite clean, how everything is very systematic. But on the other hand, he also talks about the other side of it. For example, if we take some lines from this poem, Oh America, where he says, Roads and lanes look spick and span. Look at his phrasings, very beautiful. Unclean and uncivil ways people ban. No piece of paper or butt or pups litter. Unending lines of racing cars glitter. Sky high towers and huge shopping malls fill our eyes with thrills of Niagara Falls. So, here he talks about the beauty not only of the Niagara Falls, but the systematic ways of life that Americans lead. But on the other hand, as the poem progresses, he also talks about how with the progress also comes some amount of, some amount of evil things. And then he says, if, if you are not insured in America, if you suddenly fall ill, then you know what will happen because there are high tech, high tech robbers. 
So, in, in order to say something or wage a war against what is being done in the name of medicine and all, he says they are high tech robbers. So, if you suddenly fall ill, it is always better to move to India where, as he says, the sun sets in the west only to rise in the east. He says that uh, whether it be medicine or whether it be Ayurveda or whatsoever, it is only in India that you can get a better treatment. So, on the one hand, he talks about the systematic ways of life, the manners of life that people are living in America. But on the other hand, he says, but if you are not insured, perhaps you will be looted by these high tech robbers. And then uh, let us take uh, some of the lines from another uh, poem entitled My Village, where he says, the poet, since he is from the rural areas, nature is predominantly working in majority of his works. So, he says how with the progress, we are losing some of the glories and that is why the gliding ripples. And he says, most of the huts and thatched cottages, symbols of nature's simple life for ages now stand erect in concrete avatar, in concrete avatar of terraced buildings of brick and mortar, cemented by greed and jealousy and hate. So, there the poet also hints at these builders who in a way try to provide you a sort of comfortable life, but behind that they, their greed and their jealousy, they rule the roost and we are also losing the glorious thatched cottages, which were actually the symbols of nature's simple joys. Uh, the poet uh, in T. V. Reddy, as I have been saying, he has got varying moods and uh, in one poem after another you can find. Now, for example, as I had been talking about the academics, here we can take from gliding ripples where he says about uh, the library, these they are cast away the untouchables, innocent offspring, poor victims of their aged thoughtless creators. Actually, uh, Reddy is satiric at times and sometimes he is realist also when he says, when he looks at the pathetic picture of the farmers condition, the pathetic no, condition of farmers when he says and you know uh, what is very significant of uh, Reddy is he will have a small line, sometimes the two liners, but then it will have a very magical effect. Barren lands, vanishing sounds, elusive clouds, depressed crowds, dried dreams, dying dreams. Look at, look at these lines. Barren lands, he has been able to say everything about how nature has been playing a sort of hide and seek with the rural farmers. Vanishing sounds, elusive clouds, clouds come but they are elusive, they leave us, no rains. Depressed crowds, dried streams, dying dreams, one can find uh, the use of uh, consonants here. And then uh, as I have been saying that he is also a poet who brings in his poetic over the touch of humor. So, there is a depiction of birds, there is a depiction of animals, there is a depiction of fruits, there is a depiction of trees, there is a depiction of garden, there is a, a depiction of tears, there is a depiction of love, there is a depiction of how people are cheated in love as well, there is a depiction of youth, there is a depiction of old days and there is also a depiction of the spiritual progress. But at the same time, the poet actually very in a very uh, a manner of humor when he talks about mosquitoes, you see how, what sort of adjective he uses to mosquitoes, monarch of eerie clammy nights and unkind despot bloodthirsty, fond of pond and puddle dark and filthy, a nagging source of uneasy fright to all on earth, old or young, with or without teeth. So, even though a mosquito is toothless, yet it is dangerous. But then the poet says, monarch of eerie clammy nights. So, the poet makes us laugh also, but the poet also makes us realize. 
then in one poem after another you can find here is uh, this poem entitled the gypsy woman i won't be able to read the entire poem but i'll simply come to the last lines of the poem where what the poet actually wants to say that how when somebody is in a state of you know in a state of poverty how he or she tries to take certain roles what matters is the satisfa satisfaction of the belly whether by uh, true means or by false means here the depiction of this lady is uh, that of a gypsy woman who how she uh, how she moves and how she tells everyone no with a basket woven of palm weaves balanced meticulously on the disheveled head she walks along the street and then when she meets somebody then she says she cries with an assured voice i can tell you fortunes so this lady is a fortune teller fine and she tries to earn her livelihood by telling people about their lives and then she says hear my sword sword is actually the telugu word uh, for telling the past present and future i know everything about your past present and future and actually people throng around her and then by telling sweet and sensible lies interspersed with generalization she feels the hearts of maids with honeyed th thoughts they gain a parcel of sweet dreams while see her remorseless morsel so even though she is telling them uh, uh, she is uh, acting as a fortune teller and telling them uh, some truths or some lies they are happy but more more than them who is happier is this gypsy woman she gains with her remorseless she gains her remorseless morsels they gain a parcel of sweet dreams now my dear friends we shall uh, come to our uh, own subject that is haiku and uh, tv reddy uh, was quite an expert at writing haikus and in haikus he has taken a different subjects in this uh, uh, collection entitled thousand haiku pearls he names it uh one critic has gone to the extent of saying and even even he has uh, mentioned that they are not only 1000 but then there are more than 1000 uh, there are 1008 yes 1008 haikus fine and he at times takes a ride and at times he uh, mocks at times he socks at times he jokes at times he satirizes we shall take up some of the haikus world is vast and wide for the dynamic youth to ride on the crest of tide and what is uh, uh, one added quality of tv reddy as a haiku writer is there is actually a rhythm there is a musicality fine your sweet memories dispel dark clouds of worries light conquers night fine and you know when he takes a dig at the leaders what he says leader stands on the snowy peak all the snow flies with a terrible shriek seeing his heart a gory granite so there he talks about how the leaders what they tell is not actually the truth they are more worried about their own uh, you know fame about their own belly so there is snowy peak so snow flies terrible shriek seeing his heart a gory granite we move forward even he also talks about how people become lazy when there's a cricket match and uh, he takes a ride saying cricket match idle brains boundaries watch reason clean bowled so region is clean bowled there is no reasoning you know it's a game of uncertainties and you see how beautifully the poet says region clean bowled so he also takes uh, he also makes the uses of the phrases even from the same world of cricket but at the same time he says it is such a great game but then ideal brains boundaries watch fine and when he talks about universities and all what he says our universities large stinking academic slums petty political drums every now and then we are actually bl blowing our own trumpet but then we are large stinking at academic slums even he takes a dig at the corporate and the non management world when he says management schools be hives with stinging rules garden of weeds 
you will you will always come across lots of thoughts and in the in those web of thoughts you are being trapped and then at times the poet also becomes very sensuous when he talks about how a bride's blush a parrot's biting kiss fresh on the guava fruit the poet becomes sensuous that how how does a bride bless the the bless of the bride just like a parrot's biting kish fresh on the guava fruit he also talks about the celebrations that people make at times and says birthdays march like lamp post on market road with back breaking load so the movement of time he talks about here how birthdays march how we grow like lamp post on market road with back breaking load fine so we can continue and once you start reading the haikus of tv ready you will not be able to uh, resist yourself say for example uh, he also takes a dig at the corporate hospitals and says corporate hospitals money minting unethical machines trading portals so how you are being looted by corporate hospitals uh, he also takes a dig at the contemporary situations and the way the leaders are being admired adored but then the sort of admonition that they require is provided by none other than the poet who says election promises countless pebbles in a near empty pot to pump few drops so how false promises are made and they are just like countless pebbles then he also talks about the discrimination of caste and creed and he says caste and creeds are man made walls demolish them and uproot the weeds the poet cannot be straight jacketed in terms of religion and all where he says religion is a footboard to reach the divine feet of the lord in any form on any road so religion is helpful in reaching you in making you and you are trying to reach the divine feet of the lord and then he also in a very metaphoric very suggestive way says most medical doctors are commission agents and cunning actors amassing money they are only creed they do not think about the health conditions of the people but their only aim is to mint money and then he says we are impure see the realistic note with this heavy baggage the sinful load we cannot cross the road so the poet also here hints that how we want to from this physical world we want to go to the spiritual world we want to attain spirituality but the sort of load and what is this load like the load is not pure it is already impure my dear friend reddy's haikus are so beautiful that you can find and in a very short and subtle manner at times when he gets depressed he says who is to whom in this world there is none whom you can call yours my dear friends we are all proud of and boast of all relations but all these relations are elations and the poet rightly says there is none whom you can call yours you are living in a world of maya in a world of illusion my dear friend now again looking at the contemporary tragic picture of the world the poet says reality sleeps there is no one to bother about reality justice yawns and snores is there justice the widow weeps there is no one uh, to care for and the widow weeps so is this the world we are living and that is why my dear friend when we make an analysis of uh, the characteristic features of reddy's haiku we not only find that it is soaked in a sort of nativity song it is actually full of rural atmosphere but then there is like any typical indian there is a progression from the physical to the spiritual and that we can find uh reddy's is a meeting point of the past and the new conventional structured rhymed poetry as dominic rightly says and the present unrhymed free verse reddy has said search of a soul though it is late let us start a conscious chart 
No, at times we feel, what have we done till now? What shall we do tomorrow? Fine. And we are reminded of Eliot's views. And you know, when he also ends, I mean, ready when he also ends his uh, poem entitled Quest for Peace, he also ends it with the mantra of the Om, like, no? T.S. Eliot says, Om Shanti Shanti. If we make a proper evaluation of TV ready, we can also take into consideration some of the views of the critics. And in this regard, some of them have come up with very meaningful and very subtle and uh, very remarkable comments. K. R. Srinivas Iyengar, who we are familiar with says, my attention is sometimes arrested by the striking imagery and phrasing. The poet has keen eye to mark the exceptional whether in life or in nature, very closely associated with nature, but then from his uh, being in the nature, he also thinks of uh, moving towards the supernaturals, towards the spiritual. Uh, Patricia Prime in her review of uh, uh, this uh, thousand uh, haiku pearl says, subtle, elegant, profound, Reddy's haiku broadens his unwavering focus on the natural and the modern world and turn them inwards to explore the complex realm of human and the divine. There are other comments also given. You can read them at your own uh, leisure and pleasure. But then Reddy was such a poet who actually also attracted the attention of one of the very famous and significant voices of Indian English poetry namely Nisim Ejikal who says like a gifted sculptor like a gifted sculptor, he chisels his poems with the deftness of a master craftsman and of course, Reddy was a master craftsman. So, the time has come we estimated Reddy as an Indian English poet and what is that Indianness prevailing in uh, the world of Reddy? He is actually a poet who not only symbolizes or synthesizes Indian myth, culture, ritual, tradition, legend and religion one can find, one can come across a uh, mm, plethora of the use of Indian ethos, imagery and idiomatic expressions in his world. One can also try an eco-critical reading of uh, Reddy's poetry. Reddy, even though he is a poet who could have simply cultivated his world on his fertile imagination, but then he is a realist and he is just like a reformer who is conscious of the degeneration of humans in all walks of life. Loss of value and ethics became a focal point of many of his poems. Reddy does not uh, hide anything and he very in a very straightforward manner, he also, uh, he also bursts out at the political issues and political corruptions which dominate his writing. That is why uh, the world of TV ready uh, is full of the patterns of life that we are living. He, he actually is a celebrated voice of haiku poetry in Indian English writing and uh, it would be worth to quote P. C. K. Prem who says, he does not withdraw from memories and moral instances, but at the same time a didactic essence permeates many lyrics. So, he is a reformer and he instructs, but most of the time one detects incantation, a little ornamentation and undertones of emotions when he resurrects rural atmosphere. In this regard, a contemporary uh, poet, uh, Pro Professor Pasupati Jha says, it is high time now to bring him from margin to the mainstream of great Indian English poets. My dear friends, we could have gone, we could have explored more and more of Reddy's world, but then as I have always been repeating, we always have constraints of time, but then let us, the constraints of time not bolt our conscience, but then let all our children if I have to quote and if I have to wind up this talk, let me wind up this talk by some of the lines from Reddy's quest for peace where he says, let Rama, Buddha and Christ be our models to tread their path with a will without hurdles. They light the mind with broader outlook 
and kindle the flame with the spirit of sacrifice. If children read them in their school book, it inspires their tender minds to banish vice. Today children are our wealth and bulwark. Let us guide them with ethics and truth stark. So my dear friends, despite all sorts of despair, disappointments, dejections, Reddy's world offers us a hope, a hope which actually binds man to man and man to the superman. And with this note of optimism, as Reddy has rightly said, let our children make Rama, Buddha and Christ as uh, make uh, them their models if they really want to thrive in their lives. And I hope Reddy's words will come alive if the coming generations take heed of it. With these words, let me come to the end of this talk. Thank you very much. I wish you all a good day.